insurance offices. When my boss in Salt Lake couldn't give me a raise, I saw them advertising for office managers at Mutual of New York. Uh, I phoned them and they said, oh, we just happened to have somebody coming through Salt Lake to interview and they interviewed and hired me and moved me to New York. And that's where I found my second husband. He was not exactly high on my list of somebody I was looking for. He was not a member of the church. He was twice my age and he smoked cigars. A third person who knew him, did business with him, said, Eddie wants to take you to dinner. Would you go? And I said, yeah, it's very interesting. He stopped smoking cigars because I made such a fuss about it. He started going to church with me. He was very impressed with the church and the fact that these men would do all of these things without being paid and give up so much time. Elder Earl Tingey married us and later said he knew that Eddie would join the church in his own time. And I knew he would or I wouldn't have married him, which he did and were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple. His parents came from Lebanon. He's a first generation. Uh, he was a lawyer, went to school at New York University, started his law firm. He spoke Arabic, so most of his clients were Arabic speaking at that time. They did mostly international and corporate law. They traveled all over the world. Being in New York with my husband, our friends were Muslims, Jews, Christians, we mix them up in everything. And when people are friends, they don't want to hurt each other. And that's why I think I want to have my endowments help people to understand each other better. He had a stroke uh, when he was 83. Immediately, I knew it was a stroke, it was obvious. So I called 911. Then I called President Boyd Christensen, who was the mission president. He said, I'll meet you at the hospital. He gave him a blessing. <laughs> you made me cry. <laughs> that blessing was, I command you to get well. You have many things left to do. And he did. One of the things, he made a last will and testament, and the lawyer said, are you sure you don't want to put this in trust? He said he trusted me to do the right thing with it. He left it all to me. The endowment at Brigham Young University is to reach out to various religions, the Muslims, the Jews, the Christians, and any other religion. I thought that was important. I had become very involved in the Middle East because of my husband. Freedom of religion and uh, Cole Durham, when I went in to talk to him, I knew immediately that that's where the money should go. Helen's contribution to the Law and Religion Center has been remarkable in a number of ways. Most obviously, perhaps, she is uh, committed to helping us to endow our initiatives with regard to the, the Muslim world in general. Uh, this is one of our most sensitive tasks and to have that kind of support and foundation is incredibly significant for our work. Uh, but beyond that, she's really gone the extra mile, someone who's a truly great benefactor in the best sense of the university. You just love these people. So I felt that BYU is one of the main places that could help in preserving freedom of religion and helping it to spread around the world. If my husband were here, he would be going along with me. He'd be coming out to all of the meetings and enjoying every bit of it. He would love what I'm doing. He loved the church. He loved BYU, yeah, he loved the people. Nothing that I have is really mine. I don't take anything with me. So I want it to go to the places that will help other people, help children. I'm hoping that uh, all of my grandchildren, my son, uh, that they will realize that giving actually makes you happy and <clears throat> helping you be involved in other people's lives is very important. 
and that they will be willing to carry on after I'm gone. I'd like to invite President Worthen and Helen Leon to, to come to the stand. I'm extremely honored to receive this. There's so many people that are worthy that uh, we, I work with in the International Center for Law and Religion and PLC. Uh, the one thing I realize is that you don't do any of these things by yourself. <coughs> I look back and I think my great-great-grandmother joined the church in 1846. Would I be here? if she had not joined the church. I don't know. And meeting my husband, I know, is the Lord's way of using coincidences to put two people together who needed to go along and help the Lord's work. And I know the gospel's true. I just, uh, and I love BYU, and I know that the work it's doing is helping the church so much. And I, I want to thank all of the people at the International Lawn Center for all the time and energy that they put into it. And I really just, I couldn't do any of this without the professors and the students and all of the other people that are so involved. And <clears throat> I just want to say that I know the church is true and I just want to say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, President. Thank you, Helen. We will now watch an introductory video for our second President's Award recipient. This came in the mail, honey, that BYU apparently is serious about wanting to award the President's Award to us at their annual President's Dinner this year. Well, that's really great. We, we don't really get an opportunity to, to talk to people about you know, what we are enjoying. Why are we doing what we're doing? They're wanting to produce a short video to help people get better acquainted with us and share some of our experiences. Right. Yeah, but, well, of course, it's fantastic. The, almost unbelievable. There I was with, with a wife had been killed in an auto accident. Five children, she got killed. What do I do? I didn't know how to raise five children. Do you remember when you were heading back to that Cleft Palate convention and Steve V. Wig, a former student of yours, was back at Northwestern getting his doctorate and was then going to be coming on the faculty at Utah State where you were the department chairman? And you had called him and said, let's get together. And you later told me that you didn't ask, when he was saying, I don't know anybody. And you later said, I'm not asking you to find me a wife, just somebody for the evening to be at dinner with. Yeah. First place you turned to is the church. Well, if you remember after that, you started writing poetry to me. And I always remember that one phrase when you were describing that first night, and you said how the heart, like a capricious thief, reduces this thing to disbelief. After you left to go back to Utah, we hadn't 
said anything in so many words. It was, and I thought, that's just my wishful thinking. <laughs> but a few months later, we had the privilege of getting married. Yeah, there was kind of a rush because we had these five kids. I went home and I told my boy, for example, I said, well, I'm going to bring her out. You'll get acquainted with her. He wasn't sure he wanted to do that. He was 15. She majored in foods. Foods! <laughs> he thought that was the greatest recommendation on earth. You were what they wanted, but didn't think they would ever have it again. Do you think, since they're wanting to know more about us, that they'd like to know what you did all through the years professionally? One of, one of the things that, that I always felt is that there ought to be a way to develop a tool that would be helpful. People who can't talk, who can't say sounds, who can't, can't even mutter and be understood. And uh, so then I had invented a couple of devices, instruments, computer-based, to measure and show what's going on in the mouth when people haven't been able to talk. That was my goal, and nobody else in the world had done that before. So uh, you could say I was uh, a dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you always seem to be pushing the envelope as far as um, getting ahead of what technology was available. When you invent a machine that's brand new and nobody has used it, knows about it anywhere in the world, and then to find places where it could be used and they could see what beneficial, that was a, that was a big, big deal. 25 years back there in Alabama, including the humanitarian service mission at the University of Indonesia, following that we, was when you especially had the vision of heading west, and we found ourselves living in Springville, Utah, and just happened that BYU was right there, and you <laughs> got in touch with them. The faculty at BYU were amazing. They were really interested in helping these people that they had struggled with and had been unsuccessful, or only partially successful. Do you remember, in addition to working there in the communication disorders area and that, but we also had a desire, having lived in the South for all those many years and loving the people there, and always had the dream that when our ship came in, I guess is how we described it, if we could set up a scholarship so that some minority student would be yeah. able to come back to a BYU, catch the vision, and then take it back to Alabama and be a leader there. And we got acquainted with the multicultural department and then the SOAR program, Summer of Academic Refinement. And it was so exciting because there, instead of just helping one person, that you were able to touch the lives of so many that would come there. But that was the thing that I'd encourage people. If you're able to, instead of just thinking in the future to make contributions, that if you're able to change and enhance somebody's life now, then potentially they will be in a better position to themselves be able to help others and use their talents. Go Cougars! We invite President Worthen and the Fletchers to come forward to receive their award.
what I'd like to tell you about for just, just a few minutes. We had, we'd, when we developed the palatometer, that was the dream of my life when I'd seen all the people struggling, 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 and it should be easier. And so as we were developing a palatometer in the lab at the University of Alabama Medical Center, and the first group that we worked with were, we had six children. The oldest was almost 16. And he had been in speech therapy for 10 years, had three sounds that he could say. We worked with him for six weeks using where he could see what's going on in his mouth. We had a little plate that had 50 little tiny sensors and a video so he could see a normal talker side by side with his own. And six weeks later, he could go into a restaurant and order food. We're just really thrilled to be here at, and so many ways, so many aspects of how much is done and to have seen that Dixieland group and that's just magnified so many times over here at the Y and they have, students have so many opportunities. I'd just given a Relief Society lesson and I had encouraged the sisters something like, I had a little plaque, showed, not a plaque, but anyway, showed empty calories and all the different things, you know, the candy bar, the soda, the, 